So I started planning this panel back in August um, before the election, obviously, before the first travel ban, before the increased ice rates, before the travel ban number two. You guys um, get where I'm going here. And um, every week, sometimes every day, something in the news makes me consider and reconsider what it means to be an immigrant in America. Um, it makes me reconsider what it means to be a writer in America, an Asian American writer, an immigrant writer, um, a writer of color. Um, and all of the wonderful writers on this panel navigate a multitude of similar identities. Um, and tonight, they're not only going to share their work, but they're also going to discuss the complications and opportunities that arise when their different identities mingle on the page. Um, so to begin, um, each of us is going to read an excerpt from our work that reflects the theme of tonight's panel. And then following the reading, I'll start the discussion off with a couple questions, and then you guys will take over, because I'm sure you guys will have questions, too. So Juliana, will you start us off? Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is called The Boy Who Never Cried For Me. In this story, Miami is the promised land. The promised land teeming with floating particles of piss, tanning lotion, my mama's Revlon dark rouge lipstick mixed with my tia's spit, propel out of her mouth as she drag our bags out into the airport parking lot as she chew bubblegum while yelling, this is Miami, don't you see? We've got a white van. Mira, mira, see the white van? See it? Here in Miami, we've got a, bar, a van and air conditioning. Did you bring the bad bread? Mucha ver, donde está el pan? How was the plane ride? Like shit, I'd suppose. Everything in Colombia is mierda, mierda, mierda. And why are you crying? Why is she crying? You see that? That's her white van. After three, of this is a three hour plane ride, they greeted us with a prayer and we greeted them with smashed bread bought at eight in the morning that day at a local panaderia millions of kilometers away. This bread smells like Colombia, my tia says, as she beat on the pancito con uvas pasas and I cannot tell if it's a good or a bad thing. When I asked my sister what's the first thing she remembers of her arrival to Miami 12 years ago, she says, the smell, it smelled like white people. Then she corrects herself. I thought it was the way gringos smell, but I realized now that it was just the air conditioning and this make-believe hollow walls. Did you cry? I asked her, do you remember crying? Duh, Juliana, why are you asking stupid questions again? She says, and she has my mom the phone. Here's the deal. That day we had left Bogota para siempre, and I remember asking my boyfriend to finger me one last time in the bathroom airport. I stroked his beard, played with his greasy hair, asking if he would go to visit me in Miami. Was he sad I was leaving, but was he real sad? Pablo, I said, we're never seeing each other again. Never. Do you understand what that means? He gave me his dirty Casio watch, a baby blue digital thing that beeped every hour and was way too big for my wrists. Biting on his pierced lip, he mumbled some communist shit about love. Of course, that's what Pablo would do. Quote some Zapatista motherfucker while I was trying to get him to cry. Give me a history lesson about the Mexican Revolution while I internally bit my lip, my tongue, my board as fuck hard, wanting him to touch me, wanting him to cry, wanting him to break into a song like René from Salserín and drown every policia bachiller in this Baraco airport. Ever since mommy informed that we were moving to Miami with our tias, I couldn't wait for that moment of sobbing at the airport, that moment when my boy's heart will rip, bounce into the tile floor, land on my hand so I could care for it like a dying bunny. All my girlfriends were there, 15 Catholic uniforms biting on Happy Meals. I knew this was my last moment to shine, that after lying about every single Camilo, Diego, Daniel, Roberto, after writing myself love letters in ugly boy handwriting, after tricking my sister into tucking on my neck and after sucking on mangoes and pineapples for hours to convince everyone I was the mera mera queen of dick or whatever, leaving the country forever was a perfect drama-infused opportunity for a boy to declare its love to me. And this was a real bone flesh boyfriend. I had broken up with all the imaginary ones. Everyone had to see this, that I could be loved, that someone could love me like this, that this 18-year-old criollito kid was about to lose his shit over this 15-year-old long gone pussy. I was invested in squeezing every bit of dramatic tension to my advantage out of the four hours spent at El Dorado, the airport. Invested in having my Daniela Romo moment. I was Daniela Romo, carajo, me. Because que carajo this migration and the Avianca plane? Que carajo our lives packed into two Samsonite bags, the merengue I will not hear again for two years flowing from a nearby cafeteria. Que caraco mami's blow dry hair hiding our collective sadness and my sister's clueless glossy eyes and my other chia, tia chain smoking and that guy I've never met hugging mami, kissing her neck. Que caraco the pieces of ourselves that refuse to leave, the pieces that never left and are still roaming at El Dorado, forever stuck drinking water down tintos. Que carajo, cachaco, que clase de misunderstanding. 
and the cleaning lady in the bathroom throwing a puta sarai, the fabulous smell, the tintos at Juan Valdez, the roscon I barely ate because nausea, and the cordillera boy cutting my ass for leaving my patria, the bon 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 sticking out of my bag, and the nuts in my stomach and my rib cage. Mamita, this was my Daniela Romo moment. I only wanted his tears. When we eat our happy meals, all the girls cry, all the girls but me, my 15 girlfriends plus my sister's 15 girlfriends, all sobbing, snorting snot, asking for napkins, and sobbing again, snorting snot, asking for napkins. You get the picture. But yours truly, nanais, no one drop of water. Some girls cried so intensely their entire face is covered by a thin, transparent film of snot. Like each and every single one of those girls was eating pussy for five hours, and now we dripped, mixed with the happy meal, all back inside where it started. Juli, they say, Juli, marica, huevón, Juli, que mierda, marica, que mierda. None of them finished their sentences. I stare at Pablo trying to figure out what his crying game is. He's focused on leaking an Oreo McFlurry and handing out napkins to all the Lloronas. My friends all think he's such a papacito, how lucky I am to have him. Look at that beard and those brown eyes, and mi reina, he knows how to dress. But the papacito doesn't shed a tear. The papacito and I have been dating for two months, which in teenage years is a lifetime full of passionate love, mixed dates, slimy kisses, unfulfilled promises, and in Pablo's case, too many ideological rants. He smiles at me, grabs my hand, draws circles inside my palm, kisses my neck. He writes te amo with his index finger on my jeans in all caps. He swears he'll visit, swears he will get married in freaking Villa de Leyva, papa. Swears in whispers and slimy kisses that I don't return because I'm fucking furious because there's only 20 minutes left before lining up for customs. Pablo, mi amor, donde están tus steers? I want to take them with me. When I asked mommy about that day at the airport, she says she remembers the mayonnaise taste of the Big Mac and the ugly green, green sweater your boyfriend gave you, nena. And your tia Dominique, who wasn't there, she couldn't make it to the airport. She had, hosp she had to be hospitalized that morning because of heartbreak. Se le rompió el corazón, it was too much for her. And your amigas, por Dios, crying como si se estuviera acabando el mundo. But the world was ending, ma, no? Más o menos, she says. But like, did you cry, ma? It takes her a second to answer. I can hear my sister yelling in the background, the fridge in my mom's house opening and closing, Christian music making its way to the phone. I didn't cry, she says prou proudly. I was keeping it together for you. I know it's time to go into customs because mommy's face changes to a nervous smile and she gathers her purse, her coat, the passports, one last bite into that Colombian Big Mac. Her jack black hair, one wave of sadness. She doesn't say anything, but she doesn't have to. The waves of her perfected straightened hair pull us into action. <clears throat> that hair straightened that same morning in a house that is not our house by a window with no view. Straightened flawless at six in the morning while mommy thought nobody but the hairdresser saw her scribbling invisible notes to my father, invisible notes to herself. While she bid adios the damn city, the damn city in este país de mierda from a window with no views. Este país de mierda that we will never miss because cachaco nos vamos pal norte a la promised land. And this country that is shit, that we will never leave, that we're living right now, as we kiss goodbye the rows of onlookers that are alive. Este país de mierda will be nothing but a shadow, nothing but a ghost que baila pegadito. My fucking boyfriend not only is chuckling, of course, and I'm toda amputada, toda hit it up, toda que te mato, Pablo, for killing my dreams, because you're supposed to be just water right now, Pablo, just a well of sadness, begging and pulling me to you. You're supposed to give me five reasons to stay. You're supposed to rip that passport in two, supposed to heal mommy's heart with Big Baporu, clean her mouth and palms so she never joins my tias under white van. You're supposed to lick the ice cream as it drips and bring it back to me. Pero mi reina, we never really leave. We cross the charco with a bag full of feelings, a somber look in jars of big vaporu to heal mommy's heart. We never leave. We don't really know how to. We climb into that plane like a herd of sheep after swearing to, cu to the customs guy, this is a trip to Disney World, senor. Ain't nobody gonna stay in some muggy as well. I'm full of rednecks and crocodiles. Mommy had my sister and I practice saying, hola, senor de la aduana, we're going to Disney World. Again, she said to us in front of the bathroom mirror. Hola, señor de la aduana. We're staying in unison. We're going to Disney World. No, señor, we don't plan on overstaying. We have a life back home. We have a house back home. I have a boyfriend back home who cries for me. 
We never really leave because I don't understand what leaving means. I don't know that it takes months, years, decades to leave, that I'll always be stuck in that airport, that we will fly on a plane, land in a swamp, grow mold on our eyes from the humidity, scales on our chest from the air conditioning, that even when we landed, even when outside the Florida sun dared us to die fried, lonely, and wearing $3 Walmart leggings, even when the TV promised Inglés in Barreras, the Barrera was already there, the Barrera never moves, never softens. When we're on the plane, m my sister cries. Mommy holds her hands in prayer, and I look out of the cordillera and think about Pablo's dried motherfucking eyes as mine water. All I do is imagine Daniela Romo. I call the goddess to sit with me and hold me, wrap me in the thick, gorgeous mane of hers, and rock me until I'm a platano maduro, until I ripen into something more, something beautiful. Uh, so I'm going to uh, read you from an essay that I wrote. Um, and one of the complicated things about having two cultures and writing from that point of view is that you, you come across an, a problem with audience and writing for which audience. So this is what that, this essay is about. As a foreigner, you adopt many ways of speaking. Sometimes you adopt the voice of silence, hiding your difference other times, you sound like an encyclopedia. Colombia is the northernmost country in South America, with coastlines on both the Pacific and the Atlantic, and a population of 45 million. Then, you can be in the middle of explaining the most trivial cultural detail. For example, the tidbit that people from Bogota are known as rolos. And you roll your R extravagantly, because you can. And in the wake of it, you wonder, why are you performing this and for whom? I once thought that the language that arises from these quotidian corners of power and powerlessness were never to come into my writing. <coughs> Instead, they are like crows, descending on a feast. Some days, I find myself writing and rewriting the beginning of a story, flinging the birds off my material left and right. To further complicate the matter, I am writing a story I used to keep segregated to the Spanish. It's a family memoir about temporary amnesia, inheritance, and the thin tribal memory that somehow survives from the times of the conquest, which my grandfather embodied as a curandero who, it was said, uh, had the power to move clouds. Dragging this story from its natural habitat to the cool temperatures of English is difficult. But I find beauty in the displacement because I am an immigrant. When you inhabit a foreign language, whether you want to or not, you inhabit that culture's ethos and traditions, which come nestled like sleeping dragons inside the phrasing, sayings, grammar. Ideally, Spanish is the language of my mind, and English is a language that lives at my fingertips. I like to leave no trace of the original language, I like it to disappear, but leave a skin of itself, like the discarded skin of a snake. When I use English this way, it can be an isolating agent for meaning, self, and identity. And this is what I love most. And this is also what I love most about being an immigrant, that the majority culture can act like a combustible that burns and clarifies who you really are. But the crows that descend on my stories have only some to do with language but everything to do with audience. Ideally, I am addressing Colombians and South Americans, and everyone else happens to be listening in. This is the only way to do it, and I'll tell you why. When I first arrived to the US, a Midwestern woman picked me up from the Richmond airport to take me to a friend's in Williamsburg, Virginia. I only remember the woman's eyes now, green and shrewd trained on me as we drove by the impossibly clean rural landscape between Richmond and Williamsburg. I had never seen so much widespread wealth. Statuesque houses with tall steeples sat in ample land, hemmed in by perfect rectangular hedges. I <coughs> wanted to express awe, but I was aware of the woman's eyes on me, straining, waiting to discover something on my face. I was 17, so I did the opposite of what I felt. I glanced at each passing luxury with disinterest, the twin lions, the bubbling fountains, the manicured gardens, as if I had belonged in this luxury, this safety, this ordered landscape all my life. 
The woman seemed satisfied, and she reclined in her seat and said, just last week, I picked up a girl who was coming from El Salvador, and this girl you can't imagine, she just couldn't stop ogling at the houses. She thought they were mansions, and I thought, you think these are mansions? These are just our regular houses. I mean, where did this girl come from? I inhaled, ready to respond, then I kept my words. I turned to my window. The story of where the Salvadorian girl came from, of where I came from, was not a story meant for this woman. This woman with her derision, the great sweep of her ignorance, the obliviousness of her privilege. Because that story, when told to her, would only turn into accusation. This was a story meant for foreigners, immigrants, and the scores of people marked as other. And when I told it, I would be sure to include the woman with green eyes. The woman with green eyes was now an integral part of the story. She was a quintessential part of experiencing the border, of crossing and being caught between states of becoming. So I imagine I am telling the memoir to my people and people like me, because that's the only space where the story thrives, is free and unafraid. However, since I am writing in English, every day I slip and lose sight of my audience. It all starts when I begin to sound too much like an encyclopedia. Suddenly, there's too many things to explain, the details, the beliefs, the culture, and then I find myself lost, trying to please that northern desire to pin everything down with bouts of anesthetics and empirical logic. And then the writing takes the form of that unnecessary slant, foreign. It's always difficult to bring myself back, to delete everything, but it's worth it, when I imagine the face of my grandfather and I write speaking only to him, and for him, I tell the story again. I'm going to read a short excerpt from my novel, Soy Sauce for Beginners. Um, and the book is set in Singapore. Um, and in this particular chapter, the narrator is remembering something that happened to her when she was a young child. The American visiting professor was named Colin Clark. He had come from the University of Chicago to give a seminar at my mother's university. To welcome him and his wife, the humanities chair hosted a dinner at a seafood restaurant on the eastern coast of the island that was famous for its chili crab. At first, my father tried to get out of attending the dinner. It was no secret that he found Ma's colleagues exhausting. They sat around discussing books he hadn't read and when he tried to bring up something he'd seen in the paper or on TV, they humored him for a minute or two before taking up the previous topic of conversation. But Ma insisted she could not show up alone. All the other spouses would be there. Eventually, Ba relented, but on the night of the dinner, he announced that I was coming too. Ma was not pleased. I had just turned 10, and my opinion of these gatherings fell in line with my father's. If it hadn't been for the chili crab, I would have refused to attend. In between lectures by various faculty members on the history of Singapore cuisine for the benefit of the foreign visitors, Ma and her colleagues discussed their research and their classes. Ba and the other spouses quickly ran out of ways to participate in the conversation and spent the rest of the dinner nodding and smiling politely. Every once in a while, a grown-up asked me what my favorite subject was in school or whether I was enjoying the food. But other than that, I was left alone. Colin Clark's face has faded from my memory, but I can still picture his wife, a frightfully thin woman with poofy hair the color of pomegranates, who complained about the humidity and the spiciness of the food. She finally agreed to taste a single morsel of crab, then pointedly wiped off her sauce-stained fingers on a disposable towelette. Only one other aspect of that dinner stuck with me. Near the end of the me meal, I noticed Ma and Colin Clark discussing some writer or philosopher they both admired. Something about the tilt of their shoulders or the angles of their heads caught my attention, and when I glanced back a while later, it was clear from the way they neglected their bowls of honeydew sago that their conversation was far from over. Before I could ponder the heaviness that settled in my limbs, Ba threw back the last of his beer and cleared his throat. He leaned over, looped an arm over Ma's shoulder, and questioned them in a loud, strident voice about this philosopher of theirs. What startled me was neither his aggressive manner nor the questions themselves, but the way he spoke. By peppering his speech with phrases like, no kidding, and sure thing, and you don't say, my father was mimicking an American accent. His eyes glittered feverishly, his face and neck burned bright red. 
Another colleague tried to engage him in a different discussion, but he would not turn his attention from Ma and the American. After that, someone, probably the humanities chair, signaled for the check. The academics and their spouses reached for their purses and rose from the table. In the parking lot, Ma walked briskly to the car, ignoring Ba's comments about the evening. All the way home, Ba continued to speak in that strange voice, and when Ma told him to drop it, he widened his eyes and said he had no idea what she was talking about. One evening, about a month after Colin Clark's arrival, Ba didn't come home for dinner. The following evening, it happened again. Hours later, when he finally returned, Ma hurried down the stairs. The door to the study swung shut, and the arguing started. I lay awake in bed listening. I was old enough to know something was seriously wrong. At first, my parents' voices were too soft for me to hear, but then I heard the American's name spoken by Ba in that hideous accent, and my Ma's voice rose in a shriek. Images from that night came back to me, the way Ma had laughed wildly at Colin Clark's jokes, how at the end of the night his wife had refrained from taking Ma's hand, mm. instead raising her palm in a half-hearted wave. My parents' voices grew steadily louder, and when I could listen no longer, I got out of bed and ran the faucet in the tub at full blast. There in the warm bath I lay watching my fingers and toes shrivel, as if from old age. My parents' argument stretched through the week. On day four, Ba peeked into my room after midnight, walked through the half-open door of the ensuite bathroom, and found me asleep in a tub of tepid water. He wrapped me in a large, fluffy towel and carried me to bed. The next morning, the two of us drove to Uncle Robert's house, where I was to stay while he and Ma took care of grown-up business. I didn't point out I was too old to be spoken to like that. The drive over was the first time we'd been alone together in days, and I was both furious at him and comforted. Unable to put my conflicting emotions into words, I simply asked, when can I come home? Soon, my father said, in a few days your ma or I will come get you. Divorce was still rare in Singapore, but I worried all the same. What would it take to drive my mother back to her beloved America? In front of my uncle's house, Ba stretched his lips into a tired smile, and I tried to smile back. As much as I longed to ask questions, I sensed this wasn't the time and that he might not even have the answers. Up until this point, I was still deciding which part to read. <laughs> Every piece of writing is about being an immigrant and a displaced person, so it's hard to choose since they all seem apropos today. Um, all right, so I'm going to read from my first book, um, Perfume Dreams. On April 28, 1975, two days before Saigon fell to the Communist Army and the Vietnam War ended, my family and I boarded a cargo plane full of panicked refugees and headed for Guam. I remember watching Vietnam recede into the cloudy horizon from the plane's window, a green mass of land giving way to a hazy green sea. I was 11 years old. I was confused, frightened, and from all available evidence, the khaki army tents in the Guam refugee camp, the scorching heat, the long lines for food rations, the fetid odor of the communal latrines, I was also homeless. Places and times when they can no longer be retrieved tend to turn sacrosanct. Home forever lost is forever bathed in a certain twilight glow. Even after many years in America, my mother still longed for the ancestral altar on which grandpa's faded black and white photo stared out into our abandoned home. She missed the carved rosewood cabinet in which she kept the enamel cover family albums and my father's special French wine from Bordeaux. And she yearned for the antique porcelain dining set covered by faded blue silk. She fretted over the small farm we owned near the Bin Lai Bridge on the outskirt of Saigon and where the chickens roamed freely and the mango steen and guava trees were heavy with fruits when we last visited and where the river dotted with water hyacinths ran swift and strong. This is the time of year when the guavas back home are ripened, mother would tell the family at dinner time. So far from home, mother nevertheless took her reference points in autumn, the, her favorite season. Autumn, the dark season, came in the form of letters she received from relatives and friends left behind brown and flimsy thin like dead leaves, recycled who knows how many times the letters threatened to dissolve with a single tear. They unanimously told of tragic lives, 
auntie and her family barely survived. Cousin is caught for the umpteen times trying to escape. Uncle has died from heart failure while being interrogated by the Viet Cong. Yet another uncle is indefinitely incarcerated in a malaria-infested re-education camp. And no news yet of cousin and family who disappeared in the South China Sea. The letters went on to inquire as to our health and then to timidly ask for money, for antibiotics, for a bicycle, and if possible, for sponsorship to America. The letters confirm what my mother, who had lived through two wars, had always known. Life is a sea of suffering, and sorrow gives meaning to life. Then, as if to anchor me in old world tragedy, as if to bind me to that shared narrative of loss and misery, Mother insisted that I, too, read those letters. What did I do? I skimmed. I skipped. I shrugged. I put on a poker face and raked autumn in a pile and pushed it all back to her. That country, I slowly announced in English, as if to wound, is cursed. That country, mind you, no longer mine. Vietnam was now so far away, an abstraction, and America was now so near, outside the window, blaring on TV, written in the science fiction books I devoured like mad, a seduction. Besides, what could a scrawny refugee teenager living in America do to save uncle from that malaria-infested re-education camp? What could he do for cousin and her family lost somewhere in the vast South China Sea? He could, on the other hand, pretend amnesia to save himself from grief. My mother made the clucking sounds of disapproval with her tongue as she shook her head. She looked into my eyes and called me the worst thing she could muster. You become a little American now, haven't you? A cowboy. <laughs> Vietnamese appropriated the word cowboy from the movies to imply selfishness. A cowboy in Vietnamese estimation is a rebel who, as in the spaghetti westerns, leaves town, the communal life, to ride alone into the sunset. <laughs> Mother's comment smarted, but she wasn't far from the truth. Her grievances against America had little to do with the war and the United States' involvement in it. Her complaint against America was that it had stolen her children, especially her youngest and once most filial son. America seduced him with its optimism, twisted his thinking, bent his tongue, and dulled his tropic memories. America gave him freeways and fast food and silly sitcoms and cartoons, imbuing him with sappy, happy ending incitements. Yet it could not be helped. For the refugee child in America, the world splits perversely into two irreconcilable parts, inside and outside. Inside, at home, in the crowded apartment shared by two refugee families, nostalgia ruled. Inside, the world remained dedicated to what was. Remember the house we used to live in, with the red bougainvillea wavering over the iron gate? Remember when we went to Hue and sailed down the perfumed river for the night markets, and that night the sky was full of stars? Remember that when Uncle showed us that trick with the cart? Inside, the smell of fish sauce wafted along with the smell of incense from the newly built altar that housed photos of the dead, a complex smell of loss. Inside, the refugee father told and retold wartime stories to his increasingly disaffected children, reliving the battles he had fought and won. He stirred his whiskey and soda on ice, then stared blankly at the TV. Inside, the refugee mother grieved for lost relatives, lost home and hearth, lost ways of life, a whole cherished world of intimate connections, scattered and uprooted, gone, gone, all gone. And so inside, I, their refugee child, felt the collected weight of history on my shoulders and felt silent. Outside, however, what do you want to be when you grow up, Mr. K, the English teacher in eighth grade asked. I had never thought of the question before, such an American question. But it intrigued me. I did not hesitate. 
a movie star, <laughs> I answered, laughing. Outside, I was ready to believe, to swear, that the Vietnamese child who grew up in that terrible war and who saw many strange, tragic, and marvelous things was someone else, not me, that it had happened in another age centuries ago. That Vietnamese boy never grew up. He wanders still in the garden of my childhood memory, whereas I, I had gone on, hadn't I? It was a feeling that I could not help. I came to America at a peculiar age, bubescent and not fully formed, old enough to remember Vietnam. I was also young enough to embrace America and to be shaped by it. Outside in school, among new friends, I spoke English freely and deliberately. I whispered sweet compliments to Chinese and Filipino girls and made them blush. I cussed and joked with friends and made them laugh. I bantered and cavorted with teachers and made myself their pet. Speaking English, I had a markedly different personality than when speaking Vietnamese. In English, I was a sunny, upbeat, silly, and sometimes wickedly sharp-tongued kid. No sorrow, no sadness, no cataclysmic grief clung to my new language. A wild river full of possibilities flowed effortlessly from my tongue, connecting me to the new world. And I, enamored by the discovery of a newly invented self, I sail its iridescent waters towards spring. So let's start with a pretty broad question for our panelists. Um, do you identify as an immigrant writer? Do you consider your work to be immigrant writing? What do these terms mean to you? <laughs> I mean, I can start. Um, I mean, I thought about a little bit about that question I was thinking about today, and I and I never. I feel like it was. It's the first time that I'm like, oh, I guess this is immigrant writing. Um, like, I don't, I don't, I, I've never seen it like that, you know? I do, I mean, I'm an immigrant because that's, like, irrefutable. Like, it's just, it just is, you know? It's, like, something that, like, you know, split my life in two, and I came here uh, 13 years ago. So, in a way, I mean, I am writing from, like, an immigrant body, which makes the work that comes out immigrant. I don't think that the, there's necessarily a... Uh, an aesthetic, you know, like a literary aesthetic to like immigrant writing, if that's it, you know, like I wouldn't want to do that. But it, like, just like thinking about it, I did, I, I've never thought of myself as an immigrant writer. Um, it would just be one of the other identities to like add to everything else, um, <laughs> to the list of things. It's like check, 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 check. Um, but I don't. I just, I feel like, I feel like in, in probably in the tradition of like, I mean, there's. I didn't even know how to approach this because it is it is immigrant writing because it's coming from an immigrant body. Um, but there's so much multiplicity and so much um, such a wide spectrum of immigrant writing that I sometimes I'm scared of labeling as such because it's just going to be sort of like corner as this one thing and it has to look a certain way, you know. <clears throat> so yes and no, basically, it comes from my body, so it is immigrant because it's it's. It's me. I'm an immigrant writing in this country, um, so it is immigrant writing. But also, I didn't. I don't want my writing to be cornered, um, and to yeah. I'll stop there. <laughs> um, I would say for me, yes. I think um, I I actually started writing when the year that my family and I left Colombia, and I'd been you know doing like. Uh, we left when I was 14, and I, I started writing in English because it was my, my parents couldn't speak it. So it was, I knew I could write it, and then nobody in the house would know what I was saying at all. Um, and so my, so my writing was born from a moment of immigration, and I wasn't uh, writing before that. Um, and it was also just finding yourself in this new place, having no connections to the landscape, to the people, to the culture there. Um, even though this is West Venezuela and it's, like right, it's right next to Colombia and the, and the culture is very similar. Um, uh, I had this moment of, of the first time that I was speaking to myself 
Um, and I think that <coughs> writing is speaking to yourself in a way. Um, so for me, I because that was kind of like the birth of my writing, I do I do identify very strongly with that. So I would say, yes, like I am, <laughs> yes to both. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I like yes and. Uh, <laughs> it's like an improv. You always have to do yes and. Um, yesterday, I was on a panel of travel writers in San Jose, and I was telling them that today, tomorrow, I would be a, an immigrant writer, <laughs> but today I'm a travel writer yeah. since I write about traveling uh, when I'm in some other country in somebody else's country. But um, I think it's 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 one of those things where. Um, you know, when you live in a pluralistic society and and subject matters are complicated, it's easy to say you are this, but in fact you're always this and that. Um, and you know, maybe Rushdie was right, and every kind of writing is an immigrant <laughs> writing, just the same way as Adam and Eve were refugees, and so were people on the Mayflower were both people. You know, so we can go back far enough. Everyone crossed some kind of border or another. Um, so it's yes and because you know the subject matter can expand and it should never be sort of shrunk, uh, but you know add on instead. I have a lot of other questions, but I want to give you guys a chance to ask if anybody has. Oh, <laughs> please. I'd be interested when you describing um, me. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I could say yes, but I don't know. I I uh, I also speak French, um, and so it's a very weird thing to to be aware of when you shift language, because when you shift language, is also you shift a little bit of your personality, uh, and people who are bilingual or trilingual or multilingual would know this. Um, for instance, uh, with my French cousin, my hand started to move uh, because. <laughs> Or, and your shoulders start to shrug a little bit, and you without thinking, but that's part of the language. Uh, in Vietnam, um, the way one speaks Vietnamese, uh, one falls into a sense of family hierarchical narrative because Vietnamese don't have uh, impersonal pronouns. So everyone is uncle, aunt, and I'm always brother, sister, it's brother or younger brother or uncle to someone, and so you fall into this kind of weird hierarchical connection and it's intimate language. Um, so that even when I'm asking a vendor, how much is this apple or something, I would say, Granny, how much is this apple? Grandson wants to buy it, right? <laughs> and so it's a, very, it's a very different language and then you fall into kind of like a, a, a communal or fam familial narrative among yourselves. Um, so uh, I'm quite aware of that when I speak another language. And so when you, you venture into, into, into the term of literary life in another language, um, I imagine if I were to write in Vietnamese, which I don't, I can write email, but um, I would have to bring all that complexity to bear um, because I, I would not just simply return to that language, but I'm bringing uh, this multi-layer self to it, um, which is a challenge in, for a writer to write in another language in that sense. Ingrid and Juliana, do you guys want to talk about being multilingual and how that affects either the way you write in English or the way you write in your other languages that you speak? Um, I, I would say I've, every once in a while, when I am in Colombia for, for a longer term, I will start writing in, in Spanish just because that's the language that I'm around in. <coughs> um, but the, there's so many things that you learn about language every time that you sit down to write. Um, and every, every day that you show up to, to your writing, it's like you're in a lab and you make discoveries about what the language can do. Um, and I don't have that knowledge in Spanish because I don't show up every day to write in Spanish. Um, and, and I do like, one of the things that really bothers me about Spanish is how easily things rhyme. It just drives me crazy. Um, it's, it's, when I write in Spanish, it's almost like too pretty, and I just don't, I can't 
I don't like it. Um, and I like English for that reason. Um, and even in English, I will make endless alliterations because I think I do miss the rhyming, so I have like a... <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, as you guys saw, like, I write in Spanglish, like, I, I, it's, it's impossible for me to, like, not mix both languages. I, um, when I started writing, and I started writing in English, because I felt like I was writing poetry, and I was like, this sounds too pretty, I need something raw and grotesque, and English was giving me access to not this pretty language. Um, and I also wanted to prove myself that I could do it when I moved here, and I moved here when I was 15. We come from from the same country, and I we move like almost at the same. It's like really cute. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> we've been together like so many things. Like but anyway, that's not the point. The point is that I I mix both of them, uh, and to me, voice and rhythm are huge. And I think that that comes from Spanish, and that comes from listening to music in Spanish. Um, so I cannot, I never separate them. I read in both languages a lot. I made. When I moved to this country, I did not want to move here. I hated it with all my rights. So all I did, I made a decision that I, I wanted to keep my life in Colombia alive. Um, and I did, and I dated people from there, and I've been reading, and I have a life there. So when I go back to Colombia, I have my friends, I have my life, I have a, you know, like I've made an effort, like an intentional effort to keep that because it's so important to me to have it. Um, but it's always something interesting. I've been trying to write about it. The moment I get, so when I go to Colombia, I get on the plane and I start listening to Colombian Spanish. <laughs> and the way that it starts like reaching my body, I'm like, ooh, and it's just like I just start smiling because there's these <laughs> gestures like, like you know, like like the señora, the old lady's doing, the, and like they just start saying all this shit, <laughs> and I'm just like, and it just starts coming at me, and I start seeing how it feels in my body differently, you know. Mm. How I start I when I then I arrive at the airport and I start being like taken on by the language and by this you know and I start noticing little things that I would never notice before about the way that things are written and and I'm very much about vernacular and dialect which is how I write um, and I'm really just interested in just the way that people speak daily and like most of my work is just like dialect. Um, and so, but I, but I notice it when I go to Colombia and then I just feel how the language just starts like coming into my body differently, how I feel sometimes like there's an aggression of it, you know, just comes at me and I recognize it as such, but there's still this like hesitation because I haven't heard so many people speak Colombian Spanish in so long. Uh, and all of a sudden everybody's around you and they're just yelling at you. So, um, <laughs> And then, you know, after the third day, I'm just like, I'm just, I'm just on it. And I ride the wave. And then I come here and I can barely speak a word of English, you know? Like, <laughs> I come back and then I have to be like, okay, let me navigate this. I also, if I only, if I only speak, like, English for the entire day, my tongue gets really, really tired. Um, and I, and it's hard for me. So, like, I, I usually also, like, date people who speak Spanish. It's something that I'm like, I, I just, I have to. I'm sorry. Otherwise, by the end of the day, I can't even talk to you. Um, but, but yeah, but in terms of the writing, like, I have to incorporate Spanish. Like, and I've gotten a lot of, a lot of shit for it, too, you know? Like, because people, they feel like I'm, I'm, there's a lot of people that I cannot relate to the language, and there's a lot of people that are taken out of the language. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, queen, like that's what I have to do every day when I'm reading all this stuff, you know? <laughs> like I have to do so much work daily to just understand what's happening in front of me, you know, sometimes, because I'm just like in La La Land. And so I, I do a lot of work internally to translate the world for myself, you know, to make it anything. Just, just I'm like, okay, this is what it means. Just a text message. I don't work with abbreviations. Y'all abbreviate everything. I don't. And it's like double work for me. Um, and I, I just mean everybody in, in this country abbreviates so many things. And I just feel like it's double work. Um, but yeah, so I incorporated it and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm really interested with like rhythm and the way that, because to me that's the linguistic high, uh, reality of so many people in this country. You know, not only like Latinos, but everybody who mixes their languages. I think like in Spanish, Spanish and English work really well together for me. And there's also a history already of immigrants who have done this work since, you know, the late 19th century. So I have a history to grab onto in Spanish, you know, that I can work with and that's where I'm coming from. Uh, but I don't separate them. I and we're just talking about this, about translation. And I was like, I don't even know if I can translate my work because it's so based on dialect that I don't know if I could do that. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> 28. <laughs> You've been here for 13 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, 31. <laughs> I'm 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 really old. <laughs> I grew up here most of my life. How, how did you come out of Spain? 
Uh, before I got here, it was uh, French school in Vietnam. So, so English is actually my third language. Kind of bizarre, mm -hmm. making a living out of that. <laughs> so you speak all languages equally well? Um, well, it depends. I mean, I I feel like English is my preferred language because I live here the longest for 40 years now. So, uh, but if I go back to any of those other sphere, uh, it, it, it returns. Like if I go to Paris for a month, you know, then I just fall into that rhythm. In Vietnam, it's the same thing. Uh, but yeah, go ahead. So my question is. All of you have come to this country at a very young age. I'm curious to know in your opinion, the dream. Hmm. Uh, what language do you dream in? Spanish <laughs> <laughs> or Vietnamese or Cantonese or Mandarin? Mm -hmm. I have dreams where if it's if um so the, the people that I dream about, they speak the language that they would speak in real life. So mm -hmm. my mother doesn't speak English, so she's always um speaking to me in Spanish in my dreams. Although I did have one where she was speaking English and it just took me out of the dream completely and I was like, oh, I am dreaming. <laughs> and it became a, a, like a waking dream. Oh, wow, cool. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, it, it always follows like the, the logical, what each person speaks. I think I have a mix of both. I think I, I, I I think a lot in Spanish all the time, and I and I'm and I talk to myself <laughs> out loud, which in the city is like whatever because everybody's talking to themselves. <laughs> so, so I was out loud. It's great. I was I was I was in the bus coming here just reading this, and I was like, oh, nobody cares. <laughs> and like the bus, I was like, nobody cares. Um, so I think in Spanish, and I talk to myself all the time in it, and yeah. it's my little secret to myself. Also, when I'm, I just came from the store where I was. I spent 15 days in a van with eight artists. And one of them spoke Spanish. It was great. I could just talk and talk and talk to myself. Um, I think that is also my way of just pulling in um, my own culture. I feel, I feel, I feel like such an incredible nostalgia all the time. I feel like I have to carry this thing constantly inside me, and I feel like I, I make an effort every day to activate it as much as I can, just so I get to feel connected. Like I know there are people who are able to create that distance and like run with it. I, I haven't, and I've been here for thirteen years, and it's still like. Like I see things about Latin America or videos, and I'm just like it's just I it's just so much for me. So like anything that I can do <laughs> intentionally, but these are things that I've like worked on myself because I want them in my life. You know, like I make an effort to read Colombian newspapers every single day. I make an effort to read in Spanish. I make an effort to look and see what's happening in the literary world in Latin America. But it's something to make me feel connected. So I try to activate it as much as I can. And I try to think as much as I can in Spanish. Because every time I don't know a word, it pains me to not know a word in Spanish. I'm like, but I'm from there. How do I not know that word? Um, it pains me that I, I feel like I'm losing it. You know, like it pains me that I'm like writing it in a language that it's not mine. And it's still like English gives me so much. But I feel like I have to call on my Spanish as much as I can because it's just such a connection to who I am. Um, yeah, you can feel it. <laughs> like this. Well, okay, I'll just make it quick. I mean, I was in Vietnam for three weeks just recently. And by the second week, then the dream started to become more Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. um, but same thing in France. Uh, although I'm most comfortable with people who are trilingual like me. Uh, because then when you lose a word, you can always shift to another country <laughs> to, to find yeah. the other word. Uh, my best friend is trilingual, and so we we keep floundering around until we come to the right word in different language. And I think that's the fun part about kind of being displaced. Yeah. Yeah. I want to say something on that just quickly. Like, for instance, like when, when we both meet, I can just speak to Ingrid like, I don't have to stop. Yeah. Also, no, no, no reference to anything because right. she's Colombian. She speaks both languages, and she speaks Colombian Spanish. So it's like, right? Like we can just flow. Right. <laughs> There's no stopping. My my best friend actually said that he uh, dreams in English, but with Vietnamese subtitle. One in the back, and then we'll do the. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, question for Ingrid. So uh, when you said you stated earlier that. When you came to the United States, when you started writing, you started writing in English. And first off, your English is impeccable. Thank you. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering, like, 
by uh, obviously it gave you a sense of I'm assuming it gave you a sense of kind of injury from like, it kind of separated you from your from your culture. How did and this is not my question? How did you learn English? Because your parents <coughs> did speak English. Right. How did you get such a good foundation on English? I I went to a bilingual school in Colombia. Um, and I was really good at it. It was, you know, I was, I was bad at math, really good at English. And it was, I remember the, the first things that really, uh, that were an attraction for me in the language was we had, we had this, to buy this dictionary and the one that I bought had this middle section with all the, all the sayings, um, in English and I remember just just my mind was blown by on the other hand. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and and then I just became intrigued with how um, these these sayings that we have and we have different ones in Spanish, um, how they how they carry so much of our culture and so much of what we believe and interact with each other is built into the language. And so I, so I discovered that when I was very little, and it was such an exciting um, discovery for me to realize that the sayings in English, that there are some sayings in Spanish that we have that, are, that feel very raw, and then there's no equivalent in English. And one of the ones that, I, that has just really striking for me that we have in Spanish is when, when somebody uh, gets pregnant, we say her belly was filled with bones, mm. and it's this very just raw way of saying that someone is is get is got pregnant, mm. and there's no and it's very Colombian, and there's no equivalent in in English for that. Um, so for me, uh, just and I, I love doing that in my writing too. Is just <coughs> providing the transliteration yeah. of sayings that are not available. Um, but I think that's how I, I started to learn English was, was that driving interest into that. And then it's, it's all I wanted to do. Every book that we were assigned, I like read it twice and was just like really <laughs> just very into it, <laughs> annoyingly into it probably. Uh, let's do the uh, Rich, do we have time for a couple more questions or? Sure. I wanted to ask one. Oh, okay. Oh. So can we, <laughs> I wasn't sure if you were telling us we're running out of time. So do you want to ask your question and then we'll go to Rich's. If the character change according to the language, like Colombia, you go there and meet the store, mi amor, mi ama, and it would sound really silly. You could, you know. So do you become more kind of cold and reserved here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You do? I do. When I, I notice when I go to Colombia, <coughs> um, I instantly become just super friendly. <laughs> I'm like calling people off in the street. I'm, uh, yeah. But we're really aggressive people. <laughs> yeah. We're super aggressive people. I think for me, I think it depends on who I interact with here, really. Like, I mean, I'm I'm just loud everywhere I go. Um, and when I'm in Colombia, I I mean I behave a little bit different because I'm constantly in Spanish, you know, but I am I've 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 incorporated that into my life, you know. Like I I feel like I if I cannot be my authentic self here or there, it's just like I just don't even bother. Like I just have to be me because it's just too much, you know. Um <laughs> So, I mean, of course, like, you change your behavior depending on who you are with. You know, when I'm with my mother and my aunt, it's like, it changes. And, I'm, and, I, and I use different language, but I feel like that's everyone. Um, and then when I'm in Colombia, I just like that I get to see all, say all these things and, like, everybody understands them. You know, and like I remember once I was <laughs> every time I'm there when I'm in some party, I look around and I was like, oh my god, everybody is Colombian, everybody knows how to dance. You know, <laughs> uh, I just have these aha moments of like everybody's talking to me, <coughs> you know, like things that are, if you're not an immigrant, you're never gonna feel because the language comes at you so differently. Um, but I don't, I personally think that I just I navigated the way that generally people just do, we just behave differently depending on who we're with. Um, yes. Yeah, um, I would just say that uh, the first time I realized that I was able to express myself politically was when I spoke English, because uh, my father was very domineering in the household, and he was always the one that gives spe speeches. Um, but at the dining table one night, I was like 13 or 14, and I said in English, I disagree with you, Dad. <laughs> uh, and the whole 
you know, table kind of turned and looked at me. I'm the youngest in the family. <laughs> and I realized I couldn't have to say that in Vietnamese at all because in Vietnamese it would sound so disrespectful mm -hmm. um, because, like I said, the hierarchy is such that the young cannot disagree with the old. It's like part of the Confucianist yeah. idea. And then to tie it now with Vietnam being a communist country would suppress uh, freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. So then the language itself become kind of stagnant in, in, in many ways, right? Uh, whereas in English, the I stands alone. It, it, you know, it's me with my point of view, you know? And so in the, in the strangest way, of course, I became a writer writing in English because it allows me to kind of be standing outside of the community to look in, you know? Um, so I, I prefer English in that sense. Last question. Yeah, so, uh, oh, I want to hear your answer. Oh. <laughs> um, so, so remind me the question again. I was already focused on the next one. Oh, yes, it does change. And actually, I was thinking about that as the other people were talking, but I too speak French in addition to Mandarin. And where I see the biggest change is when I'm in Paris, and my husband can attest to this because I'm generally a pretty introverted um, keep to myself kind of person. And when I get to France, I'm so excited to speak French that I start talking to waiters and cab drivers and people at the museum. And I'm always making small talk. <coughs> he doesn't speak French. So he's always like, who are you talking to? Why are you going around talking to strangers? So in a very clear way, yes. Rich, the last question. Yes. I reacted when Ingrid said something about uh, I started talking like an encyclopedia. Oh, like yes. So I was <laughs> That's very like, observant. Kind of, uh, uh, if you had that experience, then what yes. kind of uh, stress were you under, or who were you trying to please, or what kind of mood were you in? Wow, you're a close <laughs> listener. Um, so he's referring to um, Ingrid's essay when she talked about how you have to find a balance depending on who your audience is, right? And sometimes you find yourself talking like an encyclopedia. And the reason I had such a strong reaction was because that was something I dealt with when I was publishing my first book. Um, so the book is set in Singapore. Um, there's been a couple novels set in Singapore that have come out in the last two or three years, and this was came out right around that time. And I think Singapore was sort of seen as this like fresh new place um, for publishing to explore. And um, when I was talking to a couple of editors before I eventually found the one that I um, ended up working with, that was something that I got a lot of. Um, not pushback necessarily, but I felt like I was being pushed to exoticize my country in a way that I wasn't always comfortable with. Um, and I think that what was interesting about what was what's always been interesting about Singapore to me is that um, it's a really, if any of you have been there, it's a very cosmopolitan place. It was a British colony, so everybody speaks English. Um, everyone calls it like the most modern city in Asia. It's where all the expats go because it's so easy to adjust to. Um, and that was kind of what I was interested in, was the fact that everyone describes it as this really westernized place, but obviously there are layers and layers beneath that. And that was kind of what I wanted to capture in my book. Um, and so I eventually did find an editor who was very supportive of what I wanted to do. But that was the reason why I have um, such a visceral reaction to that mm -hmm. sort of um, not wanting to have to be a tour guide for my country, because that would be a really boring and not well-written story. Mm -hmm. So please stick around to chat with our writers. Please grab a drink, grab a snack. Um, and several of our writers have books, and they'll be happy to sign them for you if you want to buy a copy. And do remember to check out the Word Week Facebook page again, because there are a bunch of upcoming events. Thank you so much. <laughs>